Hello, nice to have you join us again. I'm never quite sure whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because I know you can view this uh, online sermon at, at your discretion, uh, we, but we are glad to have you joining in with us again. Uh, there are some announcements I want to share with you briefly as we look at the coming week. Uh, Teresa will be in the office this week on Monday and Thursday from 9 to 2, and on Wednesday from 9 to noon. Monday, Thursday, 9 to 2, Wednesday, 9 to noon. As we share each week, we are continuing to offer our sermons in a variety of formats. As you're well aware, uh, we have these sermons that we upload on early Sunday morning for myself and for Pastor Bill. In addition, we are providing a 9 o'clock worship service in the fellowship hall each Sunday and a 1045 worship service in the sanctuary. That 1045 service is also broadcast on a short range FM band so that those who prefer to simply sit in their cars can listen to the, ser the service from their cars by tuning to 90.1 FM. Also, if you would desire a print copy of the sermon or a, an email copy, if you let us know, we'll be glad to provide those to you or to others who may request them. We want to offer a big thank you to everyone who has dropped off uh, containers of disinfecting sanitizing wipes. We've been collecting them now for several weeks. Uh, to, we're hoping to present those to the teachers from our congregation as they look at beginning the school year. These are items normally they have to track down and pay for out of their own pocket, as well as students and parents needing to provide some. But we've uh, collected, as near as we can figure, about 90 thus far, and we'll be making those available to the students from our church excuse me, to the teachers from our church family so that they can make use of them. As you may well be aware, this Sunday evening, that Sunday, August 23rd, we are hoping to have a drive-in concert, what we used to call a Vespers service here at the church. It'll be at 6 o'clock. Folks can drive in. You can listen from the comfort of your car, once again, by tuning in to 90.1 FM. Or you can choose to bring lawn chairs and set up in the parking lot. We are asking people to observe safe social distancing. If you're going to be walking around visiting folks, please do mask and maintain safe distance. Uh, Pastor Bill will be sharing a brief message. We'll have Joanne Copeland, Sarah Miser, and Kristen Miser sharing in music. And we would like to have a time where we can pray for our teachers, as well as our students and families and administration. Pray for them as they look at beginning this school year. And we'll be making those sanitizing wipes that everyone's helped us round up. We'll be beginning to distribute those to any of the teachers who are here that night. Those who aren't able to join us Sunday evening will make those available uh, at their convenience. Uh, we are looking for people with musical talents. Normally, this would be the time our choir would begin gearing up for the fall season. Uh, however, under the current guidelines, we're not able to do that. So we are looking for individuals or perhaps small families or, or duets who would be willing to share their musical talents in our worship services on Sunday morning. Uh, this will be starting in September. We've had a regular schedule over the summer, but in the fall we're looking to supplement and add to our worship experience. So if you uh, have the gift of song, if you play a musical instrument, and you would like to share that in worship, please contact the church office and let us know. Also, I just want to give you a heads up that uh, beginning probably in the first part of September, we're going to start providing some weekly online devotions. And I thought I would begin by sharing some hymns and the stories behind them. Uh, we'll be recording those weekly and posting those. If you have a favorite hymn, We'd like to know what it is, but we're asking, let us know the hymn, but also let us know why that hymn is meaningful to you. And perhaps we'll share your hymn story as part of our devotional time. That's pretty much our announcements at this point. Uh, I do want to bring to you our requests for prayer. Uh, as we continue through this pandemic, we are praying for our church family for those who are feeling isolated, those who are discouraged, those who may be experiencing other issues related to this pandemic. It's impacted all of us in a variety of ways. But also we have some requests for prayers for healing, prayers for Richard Jenkins. Richard has uh, been experiencing some problem with kidney stones and 
and some other issues and will be undergoing a procedure here in the coming weeks, keep Richard in your prayers. For Marjorie Murphy, who is undergoing chemotherapy, also Julie M., who is undergoing chemotherapy. For our teachers, staff, students, and families. For the people of Beirut, Lebanon. For the people of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. For those in California impacted by the devastating fires that are raging. We ask that you pray for wisdom and protection for doctors and nurses and medical staff, for researchers working to understand how to treat COVID-19 and develop a vaccine, for our nation, for healing and a spiritual awakening, for those who are feeling isolated, alone, or discouraged, for those who are unemployed, and, and for those who are underemployed as they struggle to make ends meet, for those battling addictions. Pray that we may have open eyes to see clearly the needs around us and open hearts to offer ourselves to reach out and make a difference in the name of Christ. Pray for our leaders. We love to talk about them, we love to critique them, we love to compare them, but pray for our leaders locally, across our state, and nationally. Within our church, pray for our bishops, district superintendents, and pastors as they seek to remain faithful and to lead God's flock. Pray for those who are oppressed and mistreated. Pray for the needs of those you love. And pray for open eyes to see what it is God might be trying to show us in these difficult days. Join with me for a moment of prayer. Gracious God, Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers of praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you promised to do. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. Hear our prayers for the wounded, the broken, and the weary, the discouraged, the lonely, those who are struggling. Hear our prayers for the burdens and needs of our own hearts and of those we know and love. Hear our prayers for our church. Hear our prayers for our nation. Awaken us to the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This marks our third week as we work through the series of lessons from the life of Joseph found in the book of Genesis. Uh, we'll be reading today from Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 to 21. And today's message is entitled, The Cost of Doing the Right Thing. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in, the, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, 
He refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you bought, he came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Many years ago as a child, I remember reading a delightful children's book by Remy Charlotte, which was entitled, Fortunately. In the book, Ned, the main character, experiences a number of events, some fortunate, some unfortunate. The storyline went like this. Fortunately, Ned was invited to a surprise party. Unfortunately, the party was a thousand miles away. Fortunately, a friend loaned Ned an airplane. Unfortunately, the motor exploded. Fortunately, there was a parachute in the airplane. Unfortunately, there was a hole in the parachute. And so the story goes on and on. For every fortunate event, there's an unfortunate event that follows. Perhaps some of you at times have felt like your life was nothing more than a series of fortunate and unfortunate events. Two weeks ago, we began our study on lessons from the life of Joseph. Joseph's life story can be found in Genesis 39 to 50. Second, from t among 12 children, most favored child of his father Jacob, his life didn't seem, to be, did seem indeed to be comprised of fortunate and unfortunate events. Unfortunately, Joseph's mother, Rachel, Jacob's favorite, died when he was a boy. Fortunately, he was part of a large family, and he was his father's favorite child. Unfortunately, his 11 brothers resented that his father favored him. Fortunately, his father took extra care to make sure everyone knew Joseph was his favorite. Unfortunately, that led his brothers to hate him, to plot to kill him. Fortunately, his older brother Reuben talked them out of killing him. Unfortunately, when Reuben wasn't around, they decided to sell him into slavery instead, and he was carried off to Egypt and sold as a slave. Fortunately, God blessed all that he did for his master, Potiphar, so that his master put him in charge of everything he owned. Unfortunately, Potiphar had a lonely wife who set her sights on Joseph. Fortunately, Joseph stood resolute and refused to give in to her pleadings. Unfortunately, she wouldn't take no for an answer. Fortunately, Joseph struck, stuck to his morals and ran from her. Unfortunately, he left his cloak behind. And so the story goes on. Actually, as you look at his life, it would appear that at least initially, Joseph's life was a series of unfortunate events. Despised and resented by his siblings, thrown into an empty cistern only to be retrieved to be sold as a slave, his brothers deceiving his father into thinking he was dead. This morning's passage begins with Joseph's new owners, the slave drivers, arriving in Egypt where they promptly sell him to one of Pharaoh's officers, one Potiphar, going from the status of most favored son to that of a household slave in a foreign land. It must have been quite an adjustment for young Joseph. We know he was about 17 years old. 
But there's a key phrase found in Genesis 39.2, and again in verse 21, that makes all the difference in our story. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And again, in verse 21, the writer reminds us, but while Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him. Betrayed by his own brothers, believed to be dead by his father, carried off to a foreign land, sold as a slave, no longer the favored child of a doting father, Joseph becomes the property of his Egyptian master and is forced to do his bidding. And yet, in slavery, and later even in prison, we're told, the Lord was with him. He was raised to a position of trust and authority by his master because he recognized that everything Joseph did seemed to be turned out, turned out well. And as Joseph faithfully served Potiphar, through Joseph, God blessed Potiphar's household. Even pagan Potiphar realizes that there's something going on and he grants to Joseph more and more authority until the only thing Potiphar worries about every day is what he's going to eat for his next meal. Even as a slave in Egypt, things seem to be looking up for Joseph until, verse 6 tells us, Joseph was well-built and handsome and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and invited him to come to bed with her. And what does Joseph do? Well, he could have given in to Potiphar's wife, and he could justify it by saying he was just getting even with the slave owner who controlled his life. After all, what does he owe an Egyptian? But Joseph recognizes how God's hand has been on his life and how God has been at work through him. He realizes that Potiphar has granted him great trust, and he acknowledges that to do such a thing would be wicked and a sin against God. And so he refuses the advances of Mrs. Potiphar. He attempts to reason with her and refuses to give in to her. Good for Joseph. And that's that, right? Well, not really. Mrs. Potiphar is persistent. She doesn't give up easily. In fact, I wonder if Joseph's refusals seemed, him, seemed to make him that much more of an attractive challenge to her. Day after day, she tries to ensnare him to the point where it seems that Joseph tries to avoid being around her altogether. But one day, he happens to be about his duties in Potiphar's house when all the other servants are gone and Mrs. Potiphar decides that she will no longer take no for an answer. She grabs him by the cloak and entices him again. Now, whether out of fear or a sense of chivalry or a little of both, we don't know, but Joseph makes a run for the door. But Mrs. Potiphar manages to hang on to his cloak, and now feeling spurned, she decides to accuse the resistant servant of impropriety towards his master's wife. Exactly what she had invited him to do. Having done the right thing, having avoided the sexual advances of a married woman, Joseph is falsely accused of rape. She knows the truth, and Joseph knows the truth. And I have a sneaking suspicion that even Potiphar probably suspects the truth. But the result of her accusation is that Joseph loses his favorite position. He's thrown into prison, and not just any prison, the royal prison of the Pharaoh. You've heard the saying, do the right thing and it'll happen every time. What does Joseph have to show for his honesty and integrity? A loss of his position of trust and authority and being wrongly imprisoned. You know, somehow we have this idea that if you do the right thing, everything will go well for you in the world. And yet, that's not often the case, is it? There are times when doing the right thing will cost you dearly. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we read, 
live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Further down it says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Remember, as a slave in Potiphar's house, and even while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. That's significant. That seems to be the key to Joseph's life. In good and in bad, whether everything goes right or everything seems to go wrong, he will eventually come to realize that God is with him through it all. And if God is with you, you can face anything. Some of you today may find yourself in the midst of a difficult situation. You may feel you've been treated unfairly. You may feel that life has not been fair to you. You sought to do the right thing, and what did it get you? Doing so seems to have only made matters worse. You may wonder why God doesn't intervene, why God doesn't do something to change your situation, to resolve your problem, to ease your burden. Is it just possible that you're missing the lesson he's seeking to teach you? That even in the midst of problems and trials, he's with you. You're not alone. You're not forgotten. Can you learn to trust him and serve him even when your situation doesn't seem to improve, even when life doesn't seem fair and doesn't even seem to make sense? There's a verse in the book of Job, you remember Job was the righteous man who suffered much, where Job makes a statement and he says of God, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him and maintain my ways before him. Do we have that kind of a faith in God? You see, God had great plans for Joseph. We know that if you've read the rest of the story. Plans that would ultimately elevate Joseph to a position of great power and authority. But Joseph couldn't see God's plan at the moment. Before Joseph could lead, he had to learn how to serve. Before he could be trusted with power and authority, he had to learn how to submit to whatever God allowed him to face and to trust God even when life didn't make sense. And to remain faithful and listen for God's whisper even in the midst of difficult situations. What are you learning in the midst of your present situation? Or are you merely crying out for God to deliver you? Is it possible that God is at work behind the scenes, preparing you for what lies ahead? Is it possible that there's something you need to learn in, in the present predicament that will help you prepare for what God has in store? Sure, life's not always fair. Hey, life is often not fair. There are times we simply can't understand why we have to face the things we do. But in the midst of it all, can we begin to ask, God, what is there that I can learn from this? No experience is wasted if you learn something from it. In God's divine economy, nothing is wasted if we're able to pay attention and learn from it. Maybe that's what the writer of James began to understand as he wrote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many to kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. 
Many centuries later, after the time of Joseph, Jesus would gather it with his friends and disciples for what he knew would be a final meal with them. He alone knew this was the last meal they would share, and he tried to prepare them for what lay ahead. He tried to help them see that God could bring good even from suffering, that victory could come even from seeming defeat, that life itself could face death and come forth with the victory, that even when life seemed to be at its darkest, even when evil seemed to have the upper hand, even when love itself was nailed to a cross, God was at work. And God could bring good from it. When all was said and done, when the evil forces of this world have done their worst, it is God who will rule the day. Some of you find yourself in Potiphar's house today. In a place or a situation where you never wanted to be. You've asked God to deliver you, to change the difficult or unpleasant circumstances you face, to restore you to what used to be. Many of us long for return to what was, don't we? Maybe, just maybe, it's you that God wants to change. Perhaps there's something he wants you to learn, that you need to learn. And the present situation is the classroom that God will make use of. Some of you may feel like Joseph in that you've struggled to do the right thing, and as it turns out, it seems like it's only brought you more grief. Why are we so surprised? Doing the right thing will often cost us. It's the nature of the fallen world we live in. If discipleship and obedience were easy, more people would practice it. We remember that God's own Son entered into the world in human flesh, faced many of the things we faced and some things we'll never face, and never once gave in to sin. He was treated unfairly. He was misquoted and misunderstood. His words and motives were twisted, and yet he submitted himself fully to his Father's will and trusted God even as he hung dying on a cross. In Hebrews 12, we read, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, concerning its shame, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. We might add, not always right away. Galatians 6 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh, they'll reap destruction. Whoever sows to please God from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Here's the difficulty. Only God knows the proper time. You and I know that Joseph's story isn't over. He's seen some rough times, betrayed, sold as a slave by his brothers, wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife, being thrown into Pharaoh's prison. How on earth could God possibly be at work in the midst of all of that? Remember, God's not through working in Joseph. God's not, working, not through working through Joseph yet. There's more to his story that will unfold in the coming weeks. Maybe one of the lessons we learn is that God's not finished with you yet. In Philippians 1, Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then Paul says a few verses later, now I want you to know, verse 12, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul is actually under arrest as he writes this. 
And then Paul writes in verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In Philippians 2, he'll say, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Finally, Philippians 3, Paul says, not that I've already obtained all of this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Perhaps God's word for some of us today in Joseph's story is that regardless of what we're facing, our story hasn't ended yet. God has a purpose and a plan. He is at work in and through and in spite of circumstances to bring about his plan in our lives. Maybe you face some difficult chapters in your life story. Maybe you're none too thrilled with the current chapter, but the story isn't over yet, is it? Years ago, a man by the name of R.U. Darby and his uncle thinking that they had found a gold mine in Colorado, toiled and drilled for weeks and weeks, working on a vein of gold they had discovered, hoping for a quick return. They found some gold, but then the vein seemed to play out. Eventually, the Darbys quit and sold their mining equipment to a junk man for a few hundred dollars. Now, some junk men aren't the brightest, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. His calculation showed that the vein of gold they had touched hadn't stopped. It continued. And he began drilling, and three foot further down, he struck gold. That junk man became a millionaire. And later, Darby, who would later become a millionaire in the insurance industry, having learned to never quit again, Learn the lesson of a lifetime that resonates with us today. The story's not over yet, my friends. Can we trust God and realize that wherever we find ourselves, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, whatever the problem, that God is with us? Thanks be to God. I invite you to join us next week. We'll continue our Joseph study by reading in Genesis 39 and 40 and the theme of next week's sermon, Even Prisoners Dream. Thank you for joining us.